campus and uh, took this uh, seminar, was part of this seminar a way back, which I'll let him tell you about. Um, but I thought it would be interesting to hear some of the unique things that he's doing because they really are unique. Very good to see you. Thanks Welcome. Steve. Nice to see you again. Um, before I ask you how you got into it, there's, there's a reason why you have all these bright colors on. And I know from seeing you drive around that you've got a rather unique uh, license plate. What is that? Well, the tie-dyed is the whole theme of the store that I opened. Mm -hmm. uh, from the, the chairs that I do myself and tie-dye them to uh, the line of shirts and, and hats and bandanas that I have. Uh, everything's tie-dyed. just fits with my era. And what is that license plate on the car? Uh, it's X-H-I-P-P-E-E, -E, which is X-Hippie. X-Hippie, okay. But I was told that there really is no such thing. You know, once a hippie, always a hippie. So my, my bad. Well, it's like what they, they say, that if you uh, remember the 60s, you weren't really there. <laughs> and so we're both from that era. How did you, uh, what did you do before you decided to go into the ice cream business? Well, unfortunately or fortunately, I ate a lot of ice cream. <laughs> I absolutely, you think you like ice cream? I like, I love ice cream. Uh, before I got into this business, I was retired and I was teaching at-risk kids in a local school. Mm -hmm. uh, but I really like ice cream. I mean, I really like ice cream. So I came here to your class. I sat right over there about a year and a half ago. Hmm. And that started the whole ball rolling. Wow. And you just decided, I'm going to open up an ice cream parlor and come out of retirement. Actually, uh, and now this is not rehearsed, and you'll know right now that it's not. When I left this class, I said, I can do better. I can make a better product. So I went home, and uh, of course I bought the small machine and set it up in my kitchen. Mm -hmm. I put tarp on the floor, and my wife is back here, she'll attest to that. We covered the whole floor in tarp, and then I, I brought that, I had the machine delivered there, and I uh, had an electrician come in and put 220 in the kitchen. Mm. And there it was, right in the middle of the kitchen, uh, this ice cream machine, and I started with your recipes from this class. Uh, and I set out to improve upon them. That's funny that you say that because my whole purpose in doing these seminars is to show people how easy it is to make ice cream and I want people to leave here thinking, well, if that idiot can make ice cream, imagine what I could do. This idiot. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculously simple to make ice cream and not only ridiculously simple to make it, but it's incredibly simple to become rich doing it. This is... This is an incredible business. Uh, you make ice cream for X amount, everybody eats it, everybody loves it, and if you make a real high quality product, the money, you don't have to worry about the money. You just get an account because the money will follow the product. Now you're in a rather unique uh, location. I've always, <laughs> excuse me, I've always told people over the years that a place to avoid is a retirement community because they're on fixed income. They're going to go buy uh, briars when it's on sale for buy one, get one free. And yet you're doing just the opposite. You're flying in the face of that and, and charging a very healthy price for your ice cream. What's different? The difference is two things. The difference, one, yes, my location. Although I'm not in a, a, busy, a heavily traveled street or, or an area, I'm just outside of the largest retirement community in the world. But it's not a trailer park retirement community. It's, uh, I guess you would say it's middle to upper class retirement community. It's called the Villages. And I'm not here to promote them. However, it's the size of three counties. If you were to get in your car uh, and, and drive from one end of the Villages to the other, you're driving 25 miles. Uh, there's 120,000 people living there. There's 55,000 golf carts, because that's how everybody gets around. It's the Guinness Book record of the most golf carts in one community. Anyway, I'm not here to promote them. But, yes, I do charge a healthy price. Uh, the other reason I can charge that, aside from being outside of a fairly affluent community, is the product. And the product is a, a super high quality uh, ice cream, and then I added because of you, because of being in this class, I added another product, which is uh, the adult dessert, which is alcohol-infused ice creams. Not ices, but ice creams. Uh, 
such as Kahlua, fudge ice cream, uh, Bailey's, Grand Marnier with white chocolate. I, I have about 15. Uh, I'll show you the menu. I have right, about, let, me, let me hold that up for the camera. Uh, Those are all the, the different flavors. ice creams, and these are the adult flavors. And I have them on hand all the time. Now, do you charge the same for both? I do. Wow. Uh, I do. Uh, but I get a good price. You know, I found the price. There's a price that you can sell your product at and no more, whatever it is. Uh, so I do. I charge the same for, for everything there. Hmm. I make a little more on some flavors that don't have the alcohol or that are uh, a little less costly as far as the ingredients. And I make a little more on others. And it evens out. Now you, uh, the average ice cream parlor is open from about 11 in the morning till about 10 at night. Uh, I know you work very hard, but you chose not to work quite that hard. What are your hours? It started as a hobby. So my hour, the store is open from 6 to 10 at night. 6 p.m.? No, 6 p.m. 6 at night, night till 10. 10 night. In the summer, we stay till 12 or so when people, it's more an ice cream cafe than an ice cream parlor. You know, people come and they hang out. Uh, and because of the product, the alcohol-infused ice creams, uh, people linger a little longer. Hmm. But it's open only at night. Wow. And uh, do the people come by their golf carts, or do they drive? No, I'm not golf cart accessible. Oh, you. okay. So you're just off the property. I am just off premise. So they have to make a concerted effort to come see you. They're not just kind of, uh, well, we're driving out to the 18th hole, uh, let's stop in. They're, they're not only do they making have to an make effort. an effort to get there, but there's nothing... When I opened up, I opened in a, a strip center, uh, well, more a plaza. And the, the two businesses on one side of me is a gym. Uh, and I get no customers from that. <laughs> I've been in business a year and a half, and not one customer from the gym has come by. Not one. The other side of me is a sweepstakes place. And they don't come to me either, not one. Because the $5 for my ice cream, they'd rather put into the... Uh, machines there and, and try to win money. Wow. So I get no business from there. So it truly is a destination. They have to get in their car, drive to my place, get out. They can't window shop at Macy's next door. It's me and that's it. Hmm. That's amazing. And it's fun. Now I often promote in these seminars that the way to make the best ice cream is to pick and choose uh, the best suppliers. Do you do that or do you just buy from one place? Now you know the answer to this. I use in all of my, I, I have about 30 flavors on hand at all time. I use no flavorings. Uh, the only extract I use is vanilla and it's pure vanilla. But I use uh, no flavorings uh, such as we've used in class here. I do most of my shopping in supermarkets and groceries. Uh, for uh, things to make my ice cream with. And I start with cream, an ice cream mix from, you, you know, uh, a supplier. Mm -hmm. uh, but I get uh, bladders of cream every week. And uh, to that I add uh, simply uh, things I find in supermarkets or alcohol, liquor, you know, Kahlua or, or things like that. Wow. I know. That's no, what makes it so no unique. No extracts, no flavorings, uh, nothing. And the, the ethnic supermarkets are the best, the Latin supermarkets. They have all these things I never heard of, but yet they're delicious, and you make ice cream out of them, and it's unbelievable. Are you always uh, trying to come up with new flavors, or are you pretty well set? Oh, no, I always try. Really? I always try to have new flavors. I just came up with uh, lemon pie, mm. and I brought some for you to taste. Oh, good. Can we grab a couple of those containers out of the uh, freezer and show people what it looks like? Do you have much uh, takeout business? Do you have people uh, I have, uh, being home pints? Yeah, 50% of the people leave there with something. That's a lot. It is. It is. Well, we can only open four hours a night, uh -huh. so they better get it and take it home. Right. Now, who's your assistant here? This is my lovely wife, Rose. Hi, Rose. Hi. And what'd uh, you bring us? She brought, uh, this is coconut. Oh, that's mine. Thank right, you. That's yours. That's, that's, going, that's staying with me. This is a raspberry chocolate swirl. Now, this is made, uh, I make a delicious chocolate ice cream, uh, not with a, a liquid chocolate, but with real cocoa. Mm -hmm. And then I use uh, Chambord, which is a raspberry liqueur that I run through it. Uh, this is extraordinary. Uh, and this is pina colada, which is 
Uh, obviously, you know what a pina colada is, and I, yeah. I put uh, crushed pineapple and coconut in it, and it's pina colada. Uh, it's and, and in my store, by the way, any of my 30 or so flavors, I make into milkshakes. I have a milkshake machine that a customer gave me, a three a milkshake machine, uh, and I make the milkshakes all day, wow. all night. Actually. Wow, that's great. So I could get a pina colada... Uh, milkshake. You, know, you can get a Kahlua milkshake, you can get anything. Wow. What other flavors uh, do you have over there? Uh, this is amaretto fudge. Oh boy. That's a nice combination. This That's a great a combination. This is lemon that just uh, uh, it goes on sale tonight as a matter of fact. Uh, Ken, you're going to like this one. Ken's been asking me to make lemon ice cream. Well, here you go. And this is interesting. <laughs> I, I have uh, a series of wines that I use to make ice cream out of. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a chocolate cabernet, uh, which is... Uh, Chocolate ice cream and ca uh, Cabernet oh, wine. Let's let, let's let everybody see that. Look at the, uh, gee, the the, the red color. Uh, you you can tell a really good chocolate because real chocolate ice cream isn't uh, dark, dark, dark. It's got a reddish hue to it. So with the uh, Cabernet in there, oh, and you can smell it. That is, very, no, you can't have any. No, that is really intense. I just I also I wanted to comment just quickly if you have a minute. Sure. Uh, a lady asked you on the internet, or somebody asked you on the internet before, if she could buy or use a hand crank machine to test her recipes. And I thought about that, and that's sort of the chicken way to do this. Uh, you, you jump in, you buy the machine, you, you do your recipes, you, and then you're in business. Uh, because they don't translate from a, a hand crank machine to, a, to yours, mm -hmm. uh, I found anyway. One thing I like, uh, I want to point out is uh, on your container here. That's just a plain white container. That's the cheapest container you can buy. Thank you very much. And uh, to, to go out and get labels made. A lot of people spend money on the wrong things. The labels, you'd have to buy a million copies to have a haagen style package. Now this is a sticker that you've just put on here. I did it on the computer and Office Depot prints them for me. And then the flavor labels are printed by Office Depot on clear. And I just slap them on. Have you ever have you ever been to the supermarket and uh, they sell Mrs. Smith's pies and they sell all these other different uh, bakery items that you can buy? But as you're going to check out, there in the checkout line is just a little piece of uh, banana cake wrapped in cellophane, and it might say Aunt Judy's right. homemade banana cake. We don't know if Aunt Judy can uh, cook worth a darn, but it looks so homemade and looks so appealing that it's right there that we buy it. And I've always been a firm believer that instead of all the glitz, you look at that and that just screams homemade because it's in a nice simple container, it's written on top uh, what it is and there's where it came from. That is a real seller. Uh, we have a customer um, a little bit different from yours up in Cape Cod called Four Seas Ice Cream and they get uh, the tourist trout crowd during the day from 11 until about 3.30 selling individual ice cream scoops and then starting about 4.30 or 5 since Cape Cod is a destination island where you go to meet old friends and you go once every two years and you have them over for dinner they then come in about 5 o'clock and buy three or four pints to take home that night for the uh, family dinner with the get-together and it's and they will do something also like this and it's just a tremendous business that people uh, tend to ignore is the takeout business and you can freeze these down to zero or colder so that they'll uh, travel well and uh, you don't want to get involved or I don't think you want to get involved in the hand scooping of pints it takes up a lot of labor and this way hey I've got my ice cream cone let me grab a couple other flavors to take with me you uh, I, I always look at a sale as if a hurricane is going to hit tomorrow and we're only gonna have one customer come in today we've got to get as much money out of that customer as we can, and so pints are the way to do it. Ken, you had a question. Have any issues with uh, selling the uh, ice cream with alcohol in it? Uh, the no. question, because they, the camera couldn't hear it, are there any issues about selling uh, alcohol in the ice cream? Good question. Uh, good question, and no, there aren't, because alcohol is an ingredient in my product. I'm not actually selling uh, drinks to people. So it's much the same as uh, having veal marsala in a restaurant or rum cake from a bakery. Uh, they use real rum and the restaurant will use real Marsala wine, but it's merely an ingredient in their product. Mm -hmm. 
This is a uh, white chocolate Grand Marnier. Oh, wow. Isn't that nice? Uh, Grand Marnier is a very expensive liqueur, uh, but it, it makes a fantastic ice cream. It's got the aroma uh, of the Grand Marnier and the orange taste. Uh, it's, it's really a terrific one. And that's a uh, vanilla caramel praline. Ooh, so there's no alcohol in that one? No. Okay, that's a nice combination. Vanilla caramel praline. praline right. wow. Rose makes the pralines. I was going to say, how do you get the pralines? Uh, Rose makes the pralines. I make the caramel. I make all my fudge and caramel myself, as well as my cones and waffle bowls. I make everything myself. No wonder you're only open from 6 to 10. You, have, you, need, all this, you need all this time to get prepared. Right. And the ice cream, am I, well, how much was it a scoop? Uh, my servings are five dollars. Five dollars. That, that's that's pretty amazing. But he's got a clientele who knows that you have a very very unique that's product. A lot. You think that's a lot? Five dollars. It is. Uh, but it's a unique uh, product. I mean, no one is doing this big a job no. uh, in in ice creams. And what does the pint go for? Seven. Okay. That's that's not bad. No. And a quart is twelve. That's that's fantastic. And shakes are five. Very nice. You have a fantastic business, it's, right. and it's only it's, been... It's because of you. Uh, it's be, I sat right there in that chair, took good notes, went home and, and got a machine and, and in the kitchen. Oh, thank you. Thank you very, thank much. You but very much. You have a really unique business, and I'm sure glad you came by today to share that with everybody so that they'll see it on YouTube, and when they uh, go up to our website, they're going to uh, see this segment put in there, so your, your fame will Thanks. spread far and wide. Pretty soon you'll be as well known as Sadie, our golden retriever. <laughs> All I can say is if anybody needs any help in this, it's, it's an unbelievable simple business to do. Uh, make a great product and, uh, and sell it at a fair price. Treat customers great and that's it. It's a very simple business. And I'll help any of you if you want. Any of you if you want. That's a kind offer. Thank you very much Thank for you, coming. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. We're going to uh, now make some, uh, we have the Kentucky Derby coming up this weekend. I had a little conversation with this about, with Sam Pong, my uh, distributor in Bangkok over uh, the timing. I, I have a problem getting over this international time zone of what day it is. And so I wrote him last night and said, since you're in a different date, could you please tell me who won the Derby so that I know who to bet on? Well, we're going to make uh, something in honor of the Kentucky Derby. We're going to make mint julep ice cream, something I've never made before. I just kind of made up the recipe uh, by looking around at different uh, recipes for making a mint julep. And we'll see how it turns out. So we'll get going on that. Thanks again. Okay, thank you. So we're gonna use the 12-quart uh, machine. Uh, that's this one here, and uh, it's all cleaned out and ready to go. Though I did not open it up, so I don't have to re-sanitize because I didn't uh, open up the container, I mean, open up the uh, freezing chamber. And let me pass out this recipe for mint julep. That's going to be, um, oh, we're making this one in the CB350, excuse me. That's because I'm too cheap to buy that much alcohol. Uh, we're going to use the CB, and uh, we're going to use uh, ice cream mix, some vanilla, some mint paste from Italy, uh, Maker's Mark bourbon. Everybody knows the only way you can make a mint julep is with Maker's Mark. And... Uh, Paula, if you're listening, we're going to need the sprigs of mint from the refrigerator, or else I'll run out there and uh, get it. So let me give you these. And let's see, I need three over there. Here we go. So let me see how we are with this machine. Yeah, we're ready to go. And while it's processing, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, gelato uh, and the difference between gelato and ice cream. So first, we're going to get our dairy product out. This is very controversial, and it shouldn't be. This is what we call ice cream mix. It's like dealing with a mini waterbed. Uh, it's, a, it's a bad generic term to call this mix. Mix sounds like a powder. In fact, I'll show you how the Italians do it. They actually do use a powder. Uh, this came out of the cow about a day ago, a day or two ago. And this is a blend, just like you would do at home. It's a blend of milk, cream, sugar, 
and something you wouldn't know to put in, skim milk. Skim milk in the dairy industry is heavy cream with all the fat removed. So it's, it's a wonderful product. I drink skim milk uh, whenever I can because I know it's got all the good stuff in it of whole milk but without all the uh, added fat. And so this all comes out of the cow and the uh, dairy blends it together. People who have been in the business for many, many years are dairy scientists. They know that at different times of the year, the cows produce different fat levels of uh, milk fat. Uh, different cows produce different types of uh, milk. It's still milk, but there are variations. And these are the kind of things that if you try to do it at home, yes, you can do it. And yes, we recommend a wonderful pasteurizer that you can do with it. Uh, and call me and I'll connect you with uh, Bob Madewell, who uh, represents the American Made Pasteurizer. But this is so easily done from the dairy. Now, there are dairies all over the country that do it. And these people are professionals. I always tell people if I was lucky enough to own a Ferrari, I would not go home and blend my own gasoline. I would go to the Shell station and buy the top of the line Shell gas because it was formulated by professionals. So I choose to use a dairy blend. Again, we call it mix. Um, and it's again milk, cream, sugar, and skim milk and sold by fat content. Uh, this is a 12% fat. The federal government says if you want to call this product ice cream, it has to be a minimum of 10% butter fat. Uh, Tom Carvel, who was a friend of mine, uh, used to do these commercials and say that we only use the best butter in our ice cream. Well, there's no butter in ice cream. It's just a terminology, just like Ken deals in bits and bods and bites and computer stuff that I don't understand. We do the same thing in the dairy industry. We have uh, mix and we have butter fat when it's actually milk fat. But the federal minimum is 10%. Below that, when I was growing up, they called it ice milk. And it was a junky product. Today we call it yogurt or gelato. Uh, a higher fat uh, it would be 12%, 14%, 16% is what Hagen dazs and Ben and Jerry are. Um, to give you an idea of just a 2% change, say from 10 to 12 or 12 to 14, uh, whole milk at the supermarket is 4% um, fat. That would be, if that's whole milk, that's a 4% fat product. Low fat milk is 2%. And you know there is a huge difference in taste between low fat and whole milk. But it's only a 2% change in the fat content. So when we talk about 12 to 14, we're talking about a dramatic jump in the fat content of the product. And you don't, in New York, when we were up there for 100 years, uh, we had what I called the fat wars. Uh, if you're selling 14% fat ice cream, I'm going to sell 16 just so I can say I'm the richest ice cream in Manhattan. You know, that's the only reason I would do it. I don't think there's that much of a better uh, taste to it, but that's, of course, subjective. I once did a project with Godiva chocolate, and the president uh, believed that too much is never enough, and so he wanted a 22% fat ice cream, which we formulated down at Rutgers University, combined it with chocolate Godiva, and made it in the factory, and within an hour, everybody in the factory was sick because it's too much fat for your body. It also killed a cat, which was not a terrible loss, but uh, it, it just is too much for your stomach to take. So uh, just because it's a high fat doesn't make it a better ice cream. What makes a great ice cream is a proper blend of the proper amount of fat with the right amount of flavor and the right amount of air. Air is a whole different subject we can get into, and we've solved it with the infinite overrun. We can give you any air content you want. If you want an ice cream with practically no air in it, that's fine. Um, but I have yet to see anyone walk out of an ice cream parlor and turn to their wife and say, you know what, that's the best damn air content ice cream I ever ate. You know, people don't do that. We eat flavor. We don't eat air. But speaking of air, um, the two basic ideas of air we call the term overrun. Uh, you hear people talk about overrun. Overrun is like proof and alcohol. If I've got a hundred proof rum, it's 50% alcohol and 50% other stuff. So let's use that term for this ice cream mix or ice cream. If I've got a hundred proof ice cream, it's 50% air and 50% dairy. But we don't call it proof, we call it overrun. The two terms are interchangeable. 
So a 100% overrun is 50% air and 50% dairy. You need air in ice cream. Uh, gather, give you another example, and, and it's you decide what you like. A high overrun uh, birthday cake. Uh, a birthday cake is a light, fluffy cake. It's delicious. At the other end of the spectrum is a pound cake. A pound cake is very heavy, very dense, uh, very low air content, and it's also delicious. So you got birthday cakes and you got pound cakes. Which would you honestly rather have a second portion of a, after dinner, a pound cake or a birthday cake? Most people will pick the birthday cake. So somewhere in between those two is where the infinite overrun will take you, anywhere from 35% overrun up to 100% or 35 proof up to 100 proof, depending on what you want to do. Uh, but again, it's not the be all and end all. Again, people don't comment on how wonderful the air content was. They comment on how good the flavor was, how good the overall package tasted. So we're going to run a moderate uh, level fat here. It's a 12%. I'm going to run it at a medium overrun of about 50% uh, overrun and we're going to put some uh, hopefully really good flavor into it. So let me get this set up and running. Now my formula calls for four quarts of the blend or ice cream mix. This is the old, if anything can go wrong, it will go wrong, and dealing with these bags can get a little tricky. This is four quarts to the top. Oh, I'm, I think I'm good. Talking about ex-hippie reminds me of my college days. I had a water bed in my dorm room until the college found out. And then they made me take it out because it was an old building and they were afraid that the floor was gonna collapse. <laughs> and yes, I was at Woodstock. Okay, gates closed. Remember, we don't wanna pour it all over the floor. Uh, how many gallons are in that bag? Uh, two and a half gallons. And they sell it <clears throat> usually two bags or five gallons. Um, so depending on the machine is how much you put into it. Is that a local supplier? Uh, this is a local supplier. These suppliers are all over the country. There's dairies everywhere producing ice cream mix. And this one comes out of St. Petersburg. There's another uh, very good one over on the Atlantic side in Boynton Beach. Uh, so I've got my four uh, quarts. I'm going to add some vanilla. Vanilla uh, brings out, enhances the flavor of whatever it is you're making. So I, I do like to use, that's the wrong stuff. Read the labels. That's chocolate syrup. That wouldn't do. There's two great vanillas in the United States, or in the world. One is Lockhead, and the other is Nielsen Massey. And this calls for about an ounce, which is kind of a splash. I don't really measure anything. Uh, the mint paste I have came from um, a source in Italy. And I will try to measure that out to get a good reading. This is um, Brzacci, B-E-R-Z-A-C-I, white mint. It's very intense. It's got a great, great, great flavor. I really like using it and stuff. So I'm just measuring out. And again, this is an approximation. Uh, six ounces of mint paste. Oh, it's going to pour. question is why mint paste over mint extract uh, because it's got such a great flavor uh, I'm gonna let you decide I don't think we can 
swing the camera around, so we'll just let X hippie <laughs> try it. Isn't that nice and intense? That that really says mint. It is extraordinary, and I hate to give credit to the Italians, but eh, it's good. So I'm going to pour that in. Okay. And now the maker's mark bourbon. There is uh, anyone who's ever made a mint julep knows that you can only use maker's mark. There just isn't any close second. And one of the people in the audience was telling me that they only make this in a limited supply. I think it's limited to how much they can sell. But it does come in these beautiful uh, bottles with the, the wax closure. But this is the be all and end all of bourbon. Okay. Uh, that looks like that's everything that's going in here. So we'll turn this on. Now I'm, I'm at 234 RPM, so I'm going to slow it down a bit. I'm down to 155 RPM, so I'll turn on the refrigeration. Bring this out where you can see it a little better. And I don't know what the timing is going to be on this with the alcohol, so I'm going to set it at 8 minutes, and we'll see how we go from there. I do have to get the sprigs of mint, so I'm going to go off camera for a second and get that. I'll be right back. This is fr oh, there's nothing like fresh mint. Oh, that just smells so good. If you're making a mint julep, what you do is you um, take off the veins as best you can, just the leaves, and then you crush them, and you put the you put them in the bottom of the julep cup, which is usually sterling silver, and, or it could be pewter, and you take a, a mortar and pestle. You take the uh, the pestle part and you grind it up a little bit and then you put in your ice and your bourbon and a little bit of sugar and then uh, you get all that mixed in to get the mint flavor and then you put that on top so that when you're eating it you've got this right in your face uh, smelling the mint. We could throw some into the machine but it, I don't think it would be noticeable uh, in the large quantity that we have. Any questions so far in what we're doing? Okay. How about out there in the audience, do you, on the internet? Anybody have any questions so far? After this, we'll be breaking for lunch. I'm going to put this back in the refrigerator because it is a fresh dairy product. I want to show you, let me put the, leave this out for a second. Let me show you how the Italians make gelato. Now, the only difference between what we're making right now and gelato is pretty much the name. I know the Italians want to make it all fancy and complicated, and they got this measurement that tells them how much sugar is in it. I think they're really looking at stars, uh, but I don't know how it works. And they just so overcomplicate the, the process of making ice cream. But this is what, you know, Capigiani and the others are pushing. Now, they will sell. Now you tell me which makes sense. I'll give you the whole scenario of how gelato is made in Italy. Uh, for the most part, they don't have any cows 
uh, dairy cows in Italy. They have beef cattle, but they don't have dairy cattle. The dairy cattle is on the pampas in South America, pampas in South America. So the cows are milked in South America. They then take the dairy product, the milk, and they put it through a machine that was made by an American, friends of mine, Henningsen Foods, and it's called a spray dryer. It's a series of screens, and they ram the dairy product, this fresh dairy, through the series of screens, and it turns the product into a powder. The powder is then shipped uh, in massive quantities, tons of it, by boat over to uh, Bologna, Italy, uh, where Fabry is, or Pre-Gel over in Italy. And they take that powder, they mix it with some uh, sugar, and they put, up, put it up in these very pretty foil bags. They then take these pretty foil bags and they ship it to the Port of Elizabeth, New Jersey. And then from the Port of Elizabeth, New Jersey, uh, they, they ship it to you uh, in Arkansas. And the instructions say, take this powder and add water to it or add milk to it and repasteurize it uh, in a $15,000 vat that you got to watch very carefully. And now you have ice cream mix ready to make ice cream. So this stuff has traveled further in its life than I ever have. It's been, do it's been traveling for months and this is what they're calling gelato. And this is why I told people when I went on tour in Italy with Malcolm Stogo, I said, I stood up in the bus one day and said, we make better gelato in the United States than the Italians ever could. Well, everybody went into a terrible uproar. They said, how do you know? You don't even eat ice cream. You're a diabetic. I said, I can just look at the process and see how much you have to go to turn this into powder. And yet, we Americans call up the dairy and say, hey, send me over some moo juice that came out of the cow this morning. Now, which is fresher, that stuff or this? Just by its very nature, we have a better product. Let me put it another way. Here is an American product, carnation, non-fat dried milk. We keep this around uh, because we're in hurricane country, of course. And so if the power goes out for a week or two and we want milk for our coffee, we can take this uh, instant non-fat dried milk add water to it and now we've got milk. Well, which would you feed to your family given your choice? Would you give them this on a daily basis or would you give them fresh milk? I think you'd rather give them fresh milk. Well, it's the same thing with ice cream. Who's going to make a better gelato? The stuff that comes from a powder and has been on a world tour or the stuff that came out of the cow yesterday and is as fresh as can be? And the only difference is someone who really knows their stuff, really has their act together, put this blend together so that it's absolutely perfect and consistent. You know, we all know that McDonald's is a miserable hamburger, but it's a miserable hamburger no matter where you go in the world. Uh, in Moscow or Tampa or San Jose, it's the same lousy hamburger, but it's always consistent. You know what you're going to get. You want a McDonald's hamburger, you go into McDonald's, you're going to get a McDonald's hamburger. Their whole business thrives on consistency, day in, day out, year in, year out. If you use uh, this liquid dairy product, this cow milk, and it's put together by a specialist, your ice cream today will taste exactly the same three years from now. And that's what we want in the frozen dessert business. We want consistency. The kiss of death is for someone to say, oh, you know, it's not as good as it was three years ago. I mean, I actually get people who have run my machines for 70 years, and you know, they're, they're bent over with a cane, and they'll shake their cane at me and say, you don't make your machines the same way you did your grandfather did. And I go, you're damn right, because he didn't have heliarc welding, he didn't have copper tubing, he didn't have cast stainless steel. I make it far better than he did. Not because I'm better, but because my materials are better. So let's see how this looks. See, I got talking so much I didn't pay attention. That's got a ways to go still, the alcohol in it is uh, still keeping it a bit on the liquid side. So we'll let that freeze some more. That was only uh, six minutes and I knew it would be longer. So again, no timer on the machine because every batch is different. You put alcohol into the machine and it's gonna take longer to freeze. And other machines you can't even put the alcohol in because it'll never freeze. So let me put this away for another time.
<coughs> if you are tuning in earlier, you already saw this, but let me remind you, if you want the greatest source of information in the world, this blog, Ice Cream Folks at Yahoo Groups, is, is really terrific. Ice Cream Folks at Yahoo Groups, you should join. Uh, it's for free, so if you're not happy with it, it's 100% money back guarantee. You'll love it. Um, if you need uh, anything from, as far as dipping cabinets, uh, I don't know that you can see this, turnkeyparlor.com, Neil Williams. See, all the other equipment in your ice cream parlor, uh, dipping cabinets, uh, freezers, they're all, uh, the pe people I deal with are all made in the USA, but they work through dealers. With us, you buy direct. You save a lot of money. You don't have a middleman. Everybody else works through a middleman, a paper pusher. They collect the money, they send the order to the factory, the factory sends it direct to you. So what I'm looking for when I'm buying a dipping cabinet is the cheapest paper pusher I can find. And the cheapest and the most honorable paper pusher I can find is Neil Williams and turnkeyparlor.com. And so uh, you contact turnkeyparlor.com and you can get prices on any of the other equipment that you need in the store. Uh, we do have leasing on our, or financing on our machine, Sterling Capital Leasing, and you can just call me and we'll get you that information. This is starting to peak up now. Uh, the old timers can look in, and I'm not an old timer, I'm too young. Uh, the old timers can look in here and see the ice cream over on one side of the uh, spout and know that it's how it's coming. I'll give that a little bit longer. Uh, if you're doing Italian ices, uh, stabilizers, I try to use natural ones like guar gum, carrageenan, you know, that's seaweed and, and gum. Uh, they work very well. I, I try to avoid things that I can hardly pronounce like polysorbate 80. Um, I, I don't want those. The dairy mixes will come uh, normally with a stabilizer and emulsifier in them and most times they're an all natural. Is the stabilizer in the Italian ice for shelf life? Yes, especially for wholesale. It, if you're going to uh, be like Little Jimmy's and ship it all over the country, uh, you stabilize the product quite heavily so that when the truck driver turns off the reefer and everything starts to melt, the product doesn't all sink to the bottom of the can. What would you say would last in the retail store without stabilizer? Uh, if you have a retail business and you put a fresh tub of that chocolate ice out with no stabilizer in it, it's going to be good for about three to four days. If you stabilize it, it'll be good for over a week. If you're keeping it longer than that, either you didn't watch the weather channel to see that there's a hurricane coming, or you've, you've been making bubblegum licorice again and nobody likes bubblegum licorice. So throw it out, it's a lousy flavor. Yes, Ken. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, I know you touched on it before, but uh, the advantages and disadvantages of vertical versus horizontal freezing cylinders? Uh, what? Horizontal versus vertical freezing cylinders. Uh, yeah, we discussed this before, you're right. But uh, horizontal versus uh, vertical, it's very simple. We made vertical freezers up until 1919. That was a long time ago. And then uh, my grandfather abandoned them as primitive. And the reason it's primitive is if you put a bunch of cookies up here, uh, Newton's law says whatever goes up must come down. The cookies are going to be more concentrated down here than they are up here. There is no beater in the world that you can make that is going to rise heavier than uh, the liquid cookies from the bottom to the top. If you do it horizontally, everything will mix evenly. Believe me, if, if it was better to make vertical cylinders, if they made better ice cream, don't you think I'd do it? I'm the oldest and largest manufacturer in the world. And if vertical cylinders were better, I would do them. They're not better. And so, therefore, I don't do it. It's, it's a primitive, primitive technique, and I have no idea why they're even on the market. Okay, this is just about ready. Gonna let go a little bit longer.
And let's see, I'll get some mint ready here, just for looks. Oh, that smells so good. I went to the Kentucky Derby during one of my uh, hippie years. And of course, they wouldn't let any liquor in. But one of my best friend's father owned Canada Dry Bottling Company of Louisville. So we took the Maker's Mark and the Tanqueray Gin and the, everything else that we wanted, the Stolich Naya, and we took it down to the bottling plant uh, the Saturday morning of the uh, Derby. No one was there. And we filled up all these Canada Dry bottles uh, and sent them back through the sealing machine. So it put a brand new tight seal on it. So when the cops looked at us, they look at it and say, all these uh, sodas with a nice tight seal on it. <laughs> and we got in. We had another friend with us. I hope my kids aren't watching. Don't, don't listen to anything Dad says. Um, we had this uh, young lady. I think she was probably 90, 90 pounds and five foot two on a good day. And she walks into the derby looking like she weighs about 140. She had spent all winter making a coat that had pockets in it filled with beer cans. So she wore the coat in. And they just looked at her and said, there's no way. Show us the coat. Looked like a salesman in Manhattan selling watches on the street. She had all these beer cans. OK, I think we're going to take that out. And get my spatula here. We can let it run as long as we want. Uh, we could pull it stiffer if we like. I mainly want us to keep moving on, so I'm going to take this out now. Now, I'm going to speed it up to finish off getting it out of the machine. Oh, this is a nice product. If I wanted to add things on extraction, I, was only, I would only open up the uh, barrel halfway, I mean the gate halfway, and I would just shake them in. But usually I put everything into the machine. And that's about it. Like you said, you can go up here and just get the last bit. Oops. Now you're going to see Paula and uh, Vonda show up real quick. And that's it. Six quarts. Uh-huh. So how's that look? Isn't that nice? That's a nice stiff product. Even with the alcohol in there, you can't do that on any other machine. It, it just won't do it. So because alcohol stays in suspension, um, it doesn't really freeze. And so since it doesn't freeze, uh, the uh, alcohol, oh, Paul, you're just in time. The, uh, the alcohol makes everything stay soft, but not this. Now, look what a beautiful, this is going to be for Paula. It's important to keep your office manager and wife happy. So, Paula, you get the nice sprigs of mint that you got for me. Isn't that beautiful? Take a look at that. That's a nice looking dessert. So. Come over here and let, let us know how it is. Hold on, I gotta get you a spoon. Need a spoon. Mm. No, you can't use that. This is Paula Thompson, by the way. Mm. We've never made this before. Oh, it's delicious. Is it good? Very good. All right. Wrap it up and take it home? Mm -hmm. Sorry, you can't have any. <laughs> well, come on up. I'll give you some of this, and you can see if you agree with Paula. And thank you for the lunch, Paula. There you 
go. Spoons are here. Is it good? I don't admit either. You're the expert. Let me know. Because again, I've never made this before. You don't like bourbon? That's not what you said the other night when you were dancing on the table. <laughs> Is that? Yeah. Oh, good. I don't know if there would be an application, but is there an issue with running that, say, half capacity? Um, the question is, can you run the CB350 at half, half capacity? The answer is no. You have to run a full batch on this particular model. All the bigger machines, you can run a half batch. This is Vonda Putt, the money honey. And um, so you, you have to run a full batch with the little one, half patches on the other. Thank you. Would you like a sprig of mint? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, let me just wash my hand off and then I'll answer the question. Do you have room in the freezer out there, Paula? You want to put this in it? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me give it to you. Be right with you, Ken. <laughs> no, Sadie. She would love to have that. Sadie would love to have that. She'd be sleeping the rest of the day. So, we got a new flavor. Uh, yes, Ken. Great question. Uh, let me show you. They already know my secret, which is divide the container up. You know how when you buy uh, a case of liquor, they have the cardboard halfway cut down so that it's dividing up into the different positions. Well, you take a couple pieces of cardboard, just flat cardboard, and you cut a slit in it halfway down and join the two pieces to divide your tub into threes. So uh, rainbow can be any flavors you want. But let's say you make, uh, you're going to make, uh, uh, well, three flavors. You take about six tubs that you've divided up. First, we make the blue ice and we fill up each compartment with blue ice, put it in the freezer. And then we make our next run, we make a red ice, and we put a raspberry. You put, take them out of the freezer, put it in here, and put it in the freezer. And then you make your lemon ice, uh, take them out of the freezer, fill up the different compartments, and then you pull out your cardboard uh, so you've got all three flavors, and when you go to scoop it, you go in a semicircular motion, and you're hitting all three flavors at once. And that's how you do a rainbow. And so in order to keep it from running, all you do is just keep putting it back in the freezer. It's probably the most difficult ice to make, but it really isn't that difficult. You're just making three separate batches and putting them back into the freezer. This is for Italian ice? Uh, Italian ice is ice crystals. So uh, there's no problem with making the rainbow like that at all. If you want to make a Spumoni ice cream, you're doing the exact same thing, only you're, you can divide it up, but you're putting your ice cream into not just a zero degree freezer, but your hardening cabinet 30 below zero. So it's already starting to stiffen up. Also, you saw how stiff we pulled the ice cream out of the machine. Um, if I wanted to do a bunch of cakes, I like doing cakes by making my ice cream and throw it into the hardening cabinet after it's been there for about a half hour, now I can scoop the ice cream and spread it just like cake frosting with no melting and then put the uh, cake back in. Carvel makes ice cream cakes that are solid ice cream and uh, a low, a low uh, well, it's 10% fat, the federal minimum. 
and uh, it's a good cake. I love it. But you've got to temper it up before the birthday party or you'll never cut through it. I like to make cakes by buying from a local bakery a sheet cake, S-H-E-E-T, uh, a big sheet cake. It's just only about an inch thick and it's this big and you cut it into sections and so I have a section of cake and then I put ice cream on it. I have another section of cake and then I surround it all with ice cream and I get a higher price for it. That's a better cake and it's easy to cut into and you're getting uh, your cake and ice cream too as opposed to just solid ice cream. Cakes are a good business. Everybody has a birthday. Uh, I have one friend, uh, Dr. Mike, uh, not Dr. Mike's, uh, Mike Flaherty uh, in Secaucus, New Jersey. And uh, Mike is on Route 3, and Route 3, the average car is going by at about 130 miles an hour to get to the Lincoln Tunnel. I mean, it's a nightmare. And you pass by his building, which looks like an old Carvel stand, except it's got about three uh, extra additions onto it which are hardening rooms and you go how can this guy be doing any business whatsoever out of uh, a location where all the cars are just screaming by trying to get to Manhattan or trying to get home well um, right around the corner from Mike is a is the New Jersey Turnpike and along the Jersey Turnpike is a complex of buildings called Harmon Cove everybody thinks Hearts Mountain is in the birdseed business they're in the real estate business and so Harmon Cove has all these different uh, office buildings and Mike figured well you know what I can't get to see the CEO of this corporation or that corporation but I can get to see uh, the receptionist so one day years ago Mike made a whole bunch of ice cream cakes and he went to every receptionist on every floor of every business with his business card an ice cream cake some paper plates and forks and said here with my compliments next time you have a birthday or you have a corporate event call Mike Flaherty and I'll make you the world's greatest ice cream cakes and he started a whole business of ice cream cakes just doing that I mean it's terrific uh, so the, the best thing to do when you own a batch freezer instead of just sitting around in the dead of winter watching the snow come down is figure out what else can I do uh, uh, with this machine I'll finish up after this we'll break for lunch um, McDonald's well, most of you are too young to know this uh, but McDonald's started off as a freestanding building. We had one in Mamaroneck, New York, just outside New York City. It sold a hamburger, a cheeseburger, fries, and a milkshake, and maybe a Coke. And that was about it. That's what you went to get. And it was open from 11 in the morning to 11 at night. And that was McDonald's for many, many years. One day, somebody at corporate woke up and said, you know what? The building's here. The parking lot's here. The deep, fat fryers are here. Why don't we open for breakfast? And, and the whole world of fast food changed. All of a sudden said, we already have all what we call plant and equipment. All the plant and equipment is here. Why don't we just use it for more diverse ideas? And you need to do the exact same thing. You need to say, OK, I own an Emory Thompson batch freezer. I've got the hardening cabinet. I've got the store. I'm doing a great business selling ice cream. What else could I do? Well, you could be selling, you could be catering to country clubs and, and restaurants and hotels. And all you have to do is just get there at 9.30 in the morning with a few free samples and just leave them. Say, here, chef, don't try to talk to someone who already knows more than you do, or at least in their mind they think they do. Just bring them the product. Uh, look around you. Uh, there's, there's over there the Little League field, and all they have is one guy selling hot dogs. Well, you talk to the city and say, hey, listen, I'd like to sell Italian ice over there with a cart. No, I'm sorry, we already have a hot dog guy. Well, how about I give you 20% of my gross sales? Remember, this stuff costs a penny an ounce. If you give away 20% of your gross sales, it's nothing. And they say, hmm, and I expect to do, you know, $100,000 in sales, and I'm going to give you 20000 Imagine how that's going to look to uh, the voters when you say you brought in 20000 instead of spending it. And so you now have the Little League Park. And, and you just keep looking around and say, where else can I sell this product? Uh, the policemen and firemen are having uh, a fireman's picnic. I had a boss once. It's uh, the only time in my life I had a boss, but he taught me something very good. I was going to make for the Rye Fire Department just some cheap ice cream to give away for free at the, the fireman's picnic. He said, never give anything that isn't your very best because it's your calling card. It's your 
reputation. He said, make the best damn ice cream you can and give it to them for free. Let them make all the profits and they will always remember you, the people who had the ice cream. And it was my friend Longford's ice cream. Oh, we're, who made this ice cream? It's really great. Oh, that's Longford's over in Port Chester. Oh, man, that's terrific. And the, the, the fire department remembers him, the people who ate it saying, oh, we got to go to Longford's to get some ice cream. And so you're building your reputation with your own product and you're expanding your business as large as you possibly want to be by just saying, I already own the equipment. What else could I do with it? So that's my stump speech for this morning. We're going to break for lunch, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to make Snickers ice cream, and we're going to make a wine sorbet. Uh, we're going to make the Blueberry Festival is just starting up here in Brooksville this weekend. Uh, blueberries are in season in Florida, and so we're going to make a blueberry wine sorbet to kick that off. So we'll do both of those right after lunch, probably about a uh, half hour from now, about 12.15. So don't go away. We'll be here. We're just going to have ourselves the lunch with the president. Our sandwich.